Good morning and welcome to everyone gathering with the Waterford Mennonite Church community as we join in worshipping God together from wherever we are. While the need for physical separation continues, it becomes all the more significant to intentionally connect with each other for worship, to claim our identity as members within God's family, and to encourage one another in the hope and faith that we have in our Creator who continues to love us and guide us through all the circumstances of our lives. Today and for the next two Sundays, we will center our worship on the Psalms, looking at them from perspectives of orientation, disorientation and reorientation related to the human experience. I doubt if any of us have escaped some loss of our personal sense of orientation since the spread of coronavirus burst upon us and has changed our ways of living, working and relating to one another. We have been and still are living through a period of disorientation. For some in our national and global community, the impact of this has been much greater and more threatening to both life and identity than for others. Now, as we begin to grapple with what our changed future will look like, we are faced with a challenge and new questions of what may be required in reorientation. How may we be called to respond and change both as individuals and as a society as we look at some harsh realities about our previous ways of functioning? What grounds our personal identity and orientation as we look at our relationships with each other and with creation? How is God beckoning us forward? This is where the Psalms can help us to can help to guide our journey as an ancient source of wisdom and expressions of the diverse experience of being human. They hold back nothing offering words that give voice to God's story and our story evolving over time in all its messy but finally redeemed reality. In this relationship comes our help and our hope. We begin today with Terry sharing on Psalms of Orientation. As I have read through some of these, I am drawn back to my original identity and beginning as a beloved child of God, born to be in harmony with all things in God's created world, and to join in praise to the Creator who delights in all of us. So please join me now in sharing in a call to worship adapted from Psalm 145, I will read the full text and invite you to join me from wherever you are by reading the bold print with me. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Let each generation tell their children of your mighty acts let them proclaim your power. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. Amen. Thank you. 
As we consider our place in creation and God's kingdom, we have the opportunity to share with God's ministries at Waterford through offering financial support. Gifts can be donated electronically through the church website or sent by check to the church office. Now let us pray together. As we pray, I will hold up this lamp in acknowledgement and lament for the suffering and death that continues to be caused by human violence, as well as the suffering and death that is being caused by COVID-19. And through the cyclone striking India and Bangladesh and the flooding occurring in Midland, Michigan this past week. O oh God, we bring our gifts that seem so small in relation to the world's need. We come as we are in our grief, but also in hope, because you are merciful and compassionate and filled with steadfast love. Listen to our heart's longings for peace and the healing of our world as we pray in your name. Amen. And we now have a special time for the children, led by Miranda and Karen. Hi, Hi guys. guys! Hope you're doing well. Hey, Miranda and I are here this morning, and we are going to talk to you about a big word. And this word says... Identity. Identity. What is identity, Miranda? Basically, it's who we are. Who you are? Yeah. All right, so this book that we're going to read, is that going to talk about identity? Yes, and once we read this book, I want you to think of what this book has to do with identity. And we are going to read You Are Special by Max Lucado. The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes, some were tall and others were short. But if all were made by the same carver and all lived in the same village. And all day, every day, the women did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each women had a box of gold star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers. Up and down the streets all over the city, People spent their days sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth and fine paint, always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the women gave dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel so good. It made them want to do something else and get another star. Others, though, could do little. And you know what they got? Got dots, didn't they? They got dots. Puccinella was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. Then, when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and the women would give him more dots. After a while, he had so many dots 
that he didn't want to go outside. He was afraid he would do something dumb, such as forget his hat or step in the water. And then people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up and give him one for no reason at all. That wasn't very nice. It was not nice. He deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Puccinello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. The few times he went outside, he hung around other Wemmicks who had a lot of dots. He felt better around them. One day, he met a Wemmick who was unlike any he'd ever met. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. Some of the Wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would run up and give her a star, but it would fall off. Others looked down on her for having no stars, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stay either. That's the way I want to be, thought Puccinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go see Eli. Eli? Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill. He's there. And with that, the Wemmick, who had no stickers, turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me? Puccinella cried out. Lucia didn't answer. So Puccinella went home. He sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself, and he decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on his tippy toes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his arm. Puccinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here, and he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Puccinello, the voice was deep and strong. Puccinello stopped. Puccinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Puccinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The late little Wemmick asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm, the maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the gray dots. Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me, child. I don't care what other women think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who they are to give stars or dots. They're women just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Puccinello. All that matters is what I think, and I think you are pretty special. Puccinello laughed. Me special? Why? I can't walk fast, I can't jump, my paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Puccinello, put his hands on those small wooden shoulders, and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Puccinello had never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Puccinello. I know. She told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly because she had decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if you, they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Puccinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said as the Wemmick walked out the door, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Puccinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, 
a dot fell to the ground. Remember, you are special because God made you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Miranda, I think Eli is kind of like God. Do you think that too? Yeah, I do. Because he told Puchnella that he made him. And God made all of us. Yeah, Eli also told Puccinello that he was special no matter what other people think. Do you ever think that your identity has to do with what other people think of you? Yes, I do. God made us for who we are. So how do you work on claiming your identity with God and not what other people think about you? I work on claiming my identity with God by remembering that he made me just as I am. That is a really good way to remember mm -hmm. that you are special in God's eyes. And remember, you, you are special too. Let's pray. Dear God, let us remember that you made us and we are special no matter what other people think. Amen. Our scripture this morning is Psalm 8, which I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Good morning. May the Lord be with us this day. As Liz said, we are taking the next three Sundays to spend a little time with the Psalms. And you may have thought over the years as you have read the Psalms, is there not some structure, some rhyme or reason to these haphazard groups of writing? And I know that thought has crossed my mind as well. And while you can divide and organize and put them into categories and subjects, perhaps another way to think about them would be in terms of movement. Old Testament scholar and theologian Walter Brueggemann in a little book called Spirituality of the Psalms suggests that perhaps a way to look at the Psalms is in the form of experience and movement from orientation to disorientation to reorientation. And when you think about it, you realize that's really a lot of what happens in life. We start out and we are moving along and things seem to be pretty stable. There seems to be an orientation to life. And then something happens that throws us completely off kilter and we move into a, a season of disorientation. And then gradually, hopefully, we move back toward a, a reorientation to life. I think that Brueggemann is onto something here because I, I think that in many ways to think about the Psalms reflecting this kind of movement uh, as we travel through life, I, I find quite helpful. And so we're taking Brueggemann's observation and using it as a frame of reference for these next three Sundays. Today, I would like to speak about orientation a little bit. And next Sunday, Arnold Roth will be speaking to us about a, a Psalm of disorientation. And then the following Sunday, our congregational coach, Ron Gingrich, will be speaking to us about reorientation. Uh, we hope that you will be blessed by these, uh, this little short series on the book of Psalms. So today, a Psalm of orientation. And I have, as we begin, a couple of questions. Like the first one is, what exactly is a, a Psalm of orientation? You may be wondering of what that is. And perhaps the simplest way to answer that is to say that these kind of Psalms reflect a profound gratitude to God for a world that is well-ordered and reliable and life-giving. And that really is kind of the big picture. And there is no one particular kind of psalm of orientation. 
And I would guess that if you would think about it, as you are familiar with the Psalms, you, you may realize that as well. So for example, maybe a first way to think about a Psalm of orientation is to think about nature. Because as you think about nature, you begin to realize that there's something ordered in this, uh, in this understanding of the world. And in many ways, what the Psalms get at is that the world is God's way of bestowing blessing upon us. We encounter God's own being in creation, and there is an orderliness to it. It sustains life. It provides for the needs of the day. And here on the screen are a few examples. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 8, and so these words, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, that, that kind of gets at what, what this segment might be like. Or, you know, Psalm 145, you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every, every living thing. So that just kind of gets at this understanding of God's orientation that we see throughout nature. But there would be also other Psalms that move toward orientation as well. Uh, that may describe behavior. And it's not so much the law as we kind of think about uh, uh, Old Testament stuff. Um, rather, it is our response as people as we pay attention and participate in God's ordered way of creation. And here are a few examples. So, for example, Psalm 1, this very familiar psalm. The one who meditates on the law of the Lord is like a tree planted by streams of water yielding in its fruit. A psalm of orientation using the law and nature. Or Psalm 119, I run in the path of your commands for you have set my heart free. Again, getting at this kind of behavior that, uh, that goes on. There are some other psalms of orientation that, that we could talk about as well, like psalms of wisdom or wisdom psalms and psalms of well-being. The wisdom psalms tend to, to talk more in instructive ways. So like Psalm 37, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for God. Or Psalm 14, on the other side of the coin, the fool says in their heart, there is no God. And then the rest of the Psalm talks about oh, what life is like as people are foolish. Psalms of, of well-being are, are more subtle in a sense in that they are, are simply using images of everyday life to talk about the well-orderedness of the world that we live in. So, for example, Psalm 131, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My soul is still and quieted within me like a weaned child with its mother. All of these psalms of orientation point toward a world that is reliable and life-giving. God has ordered it this way, ordained it this way, and is presiding over it. That's the big picture of what a, a psalm of orientation would look like. Now, having said that, there is a, a second question that is kind of floating around in my mind, and it would, it would be this. Is orientation an outcome of privilege? And this comes from the realization, my awareness as I've grown older, that I grew up in a, a very stable family with a Christian faith that was very important to our family. And in so doing, that has made it easier for me to see and experience God's orientation. It has also led to choices that I've made that have moved more toward orientation than disorientation. And that has in turn, as the years have gone on, led to an ease of speaking about orientation as a sure thing. It's my experience. But I have also come to realize that that has not been everybody else's experience. If injustice and instability have been your experience, if you have been a part of abusive relationships, does this orderliness mean anything to you? Does this psalm, do these psalms of orientation connect with you? Because I know I'm coming from a very different point of view, but my point of view may not be your point of view. This may seem like a weird thing to say in a sermon, but it's just me trying to grapple with Scripture and wanting to be careful that Scripture is not at my service. That is, I'm not trying to justify something by quoting Scripture or using Scripture. Rather, I want to be at the service of Scripture and say that I want to be open to God and what God might be trying to say in the midst of this Scripture. In other words, I don't know everything. But I do welcome the wisdom that comes from folks who have encountered God in the midst of a life that has been very different from mine. 
and I'm serious. I do enjoy these conversations, and I, I would welcome them if you would like to talk further with me about that. Having said that, let's look at Psalm 8. This psalm starts out with very familiar words. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. There are several images in this psalm that I find intriguing, but I wonder, are there images here? Is there something in this psalm that jumps out at you? Perhaps it's the image of the heavenly night skies. If you get away from light pollution out into dark sky country, it is truly amazing what you can see. Cheryl and I enjoy being up in northern Michigan and up in the UP camping along Lake Michigan or Lake Superior. And we sit out a good part of the night just looking up into the sky as it moves across the horizon. It is phenomenal what you see. The work of your fingers, your glory set in the heavens. It is breathtaking. Does this image capture your imagination? Or what about the line of the praise of children and infants silencing foe and avenger alike? There's an image for you. I wonder what exactly that means. Or what about the line that speaks of people like you and me having been made a little lower than the angels and being crowned with glory and honor? I wonder what that looks like. Or that God has made us the rulers over the works of God's hands, flocks and herds, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea. That just feels really incredible. There's so much to choose from here in this psalm, such incredible imagery, but I wonder what stands out for you, what captures your imagination in this psalm. For me, it is the phrase, and I'm paraphrasing here, Lord, when I consider what you have done, who am I? Who am I that you would be mindful of me, that you would even care? Or as the Hebrew suggests, who are we that you would remember and visit us? Even more, who are we that you would give us a job, <laughs> that you would trust us with such responsibility? And I phrase it this way in the personal, first person setting more than the corporate, because this has been an important question to me at different points in my life in many ways, in two different ways anyway. Who am I dealing with identity, but also who am I dealing with feelings of being unworthy at times? And so it leads me to ask this question. I wonder how we hear this psalm of orientation at different points in our lives. Did we hear this differently when we were 15 or 35 or 55 or, or 85? Well, I hear it differently when I'm 85 than I do now in my 60s. And here is something else. Did you notice the flow of this psalm, the symmetrical structure with which it is written? It looks like this. It starts out with the expression of praise for God and then it moves to God's work and then this question, who am I or who are we? And then back to God's work and then back to the expression of, of praise for God. If we were to stand this structure on its head and look down it, I, I think it looks something like this. Concentric circles with the seeming energy of the psalm starting at the outside ring and then flowing into the inside ring and, and then back out again. There is movement in this psalm. There is a sense of, of traveling from one thing to the next, much like we were talking about this movement from orientation to disorientation to reorientation, except the movement here is happening all within the understanding the context of orientation. And maybe that's our first clue. Whether you're talking about seasons of orientation or disorientation, where we are not, not meant to be stagnant. And I say that simply because we were created by a God who is not bound by stagnation. And I keep coming back to my question, who am I that God is mindful of me? Does this question mean different things at different points in our lives? For example, at 15, I am a gangly teenager, and I have heard this psalm before many times in church, but also growing up at our home, we would have family devotions at breakfast, and my dad would read this psalm. I enjoyed the night skies, the beauty of the stars, and in central Illinois, if, if lightning and thunderstorms were rolling across the, the sky to cover the stars, that was even better. But at 15, God's crowning glory of making me a little lower than the angels meant having a car with an eight-track tape player in it. 
And yes, as you can see, it wasn't much of a car, but that was my identity. My faith was my family's faith. Oh Lord, our Lord, that meant my family, our family. How majestic is your name? It would have been more majestic, God, if you could have given me that 1969 AMC Javelin with a high-rise cam in the engine and 60 series tires, those wide tires on the back of that car. But apparently, you did not give me the right father for that kind of car. You gave me the wrong father for that kind of car. And so here I am with this sensible and boring and quite frankly, ugly 1964 Ford Falcon. It felt like a real injustice at the time things not going my way. But the first real season of disorientation was a handful of years away yet. And at this moment, life was good. It was stable. But yet, I was aware that there was more to life than just my car and the identity that it gave me. It came in part from the words of the psalmist, but also from my parents. James May in his commentary on the Psalms reminds us that human beings have an office in the world that the generic human being is an official of the administrative arrangement of the kingdom of God. I like that a lot, that we as human beings are an official in the administrative arrangement of the kingdom of God. You know, my parents did not read commentaries when I was growing up, but they certainly understood this and they drilled this into my head. Time passes, years. I'm 38 years old here now in this picture. Our youngest son has just been born and I am feeling pretty confident in my role as a husband and a father and a pastor. Surely I'm doing God's work now. Having outgrown my need for a fast car that gets poor gas mileage, I'm caring for the part of creation that God has given me. These things give me identity. Who am I? This is who I am. They are such good things, God, and I am doing my best. I use this psalm to lead worship, but it's different than when I was 15. Michael W. Smith comes out with a song based on this psalm, and it's number 112 in our new blue Mennonite hymnal. And we sing this song at the top of our lungs in worship. Surely this is what it means to praise you, God. O Lord, our Lord, is wrapped up in communal life of living in a small town in Kansas that is predominantly filled with Mennonites. A little narrow, a little ingrown at times, but life is good. More time passes, a lot of years of living, a lot of years of pastoring, but none of it prepared me for this, cancer and chemo, a lot of chemo. I had walked through the valley of cancer with many people. I had buried many dear friends who had died from cancer. But now it was me. It was my turn. It was my family's turn. One of several disorienting seasons in my life. Who am I now? A husband? A father? A pastor? A cancer survivor? All of those feel really inadequate in describing. Maybe the simple way to answer that question is to quote a phrase from Brueggemann in his book, as to where the Psalms lead us. And, and I'm guessing that Arnold and Ron will, will give voice to this as well in the next couple of Sundays. I am, we are, surprised by a new gift from God, a new coherence made present to us just when we thought all was lost. Maybe the way to speak about orientation for me is to mention a few things that I've learned, like I was touched by a broken world. There was nothing I could do I needed something from outside myself. Only by standing on the shoulders of Christ and others could I survive, and, and that and took incredible grace. It was hard for me to accept. The real answer to who am I, whether you're talking about identity or feelings of worth, I am made alive, whether in life or death, God has prepared good works as a way of life for me in this world and the next. I am an official in the administrative arrangement of the kingdom of God. This is who I am, and this is who you are too. It reminds me of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, for we are what God made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God created beforehand 
to be our way of life. I find that what I learned gets at the core of the meaning of a psalm of orientation. O Lord, our Lord, now is closer to the Hebrew word that is used here for Lord Adonai, or my Lord, the sovereign one, who has been mindful of me in my lowly estate, the one who stands at the gates of life and death so that we do not have to go through them alone, the one who exists in the cosmos, ordering and reordering so that chaos does not prevail. Our Lord means more now than just family or cultural milieu that I might live in, whether it's good or bad. It now means tangible people who had hope and faith on my behalf when I wasn't able to. It means tangible people who cared when I found it was impossible. Oh Lord, our Lord, it means that I am a part of a larger whole, a part of the cosmos that God has put into place. It's so much more than anything I might own, so much more than any role that I might have, no matter how good or, or noble it might be. In many ways, the structure of Psalm 8 mirrors the structure of the cosmos, the structure of our lives, our lives that have the possibility of experiencing orientation. God and humanity anchor it, and like a tuning fork, animate the structure of the psalm. The praise of God frames and encompasses the world from beginning to end, and at the structural center is humanity. It's us. And I am, and as I mentioned earlier, this is not a stagnant thing. The mutual regard, and I find this incredibly important as you look at the psalm, the mutual regard between God and humanity connects and animates these two points of the psalm. God from the outside looks inward toward humanity with care and concern and amen to that. And humanity from the middle looks out toward God in praise. And the entire psalm reverberates like a tuning fork of divine love and human adoration back and forth and back and forth and back and forth throughout time. Whether you're 15 or 35 or 55 or 85, orientation is found in this rhythmic response between God and you and I. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Indeed. And so may you know and experience God's orientation this day, no matter what age you are. May God be with us. Amen.
am Cindy Voth, and I'm on the pastoral team here at Waterford Mennonite Church. As a faith community, one of the significant things that we do is that we warmly welcome people into fellowship and membership among us. Another substantial thing that we do is that we send people out from us with our blessing and our prayers. This morning, we have the opportunity to send Stanley and Ursula Green with our blessing as they will be relocating to Southern California at the beginning of June. Stanley will be becoming the conference minister for the Pacific Southwest Conference. Stanley and Ursula and their sons, Lee and James, moved to our community in 1993, 27 years ago. And so for 27 years, they have been among us. We have done life together. We have laughed, we have cried, we have worshiped, we have celebrated. And so this morning, we wanna take this opportunity to send them with our blessing. During their time here among us, Ursula has been a part of the Praying Companion Sunday School class. And so we will hear a blessing from them. For the past 10 years or so, Stanley has been meeting with a group of men as a prayer and support group. And we will hear a blessing from them. We will also hear a word from Stanley and Ursula as they prepare to leave. In addition, I invite you to read your buzz as you will find a letter in it today from Stanley and Ursula. This is uh, written by the members of Ursula Green's Sunday School class, The Praying Companions. Our sister Ursh of noble character, inspired by Proverbs 31. Our sister Ursh of noble character is worth far more than the classy earrings she wears. Her husband has full confidence in her. He travels around the world knowing that she will be able to fix any plumbing problems that arise in his absence. She will stack stools on chairs to re reach pipes that need attention and make an impromptu brace to hold them in place. She shops at Goodwill, selecting scarves and zebra print fabric for an unsurpassed elegance. She is like the merchant ships, bringing spices from around the world for her delicious curries, succulent scones, and best ever chai. As a much loved teacher, she got up while it was still dark to prepare for her classes. Love for children flows from her. School principals sent her the most incorrigible students. Our sister Ursh of noble character did not see them as troublemakers, but loved them into being their best selves. Her delight is in God whom she faithfully serves she lifts her voice in praise and moves all who listen into a spirit of worship. She passes on her musical gifts to her sons. They arise and call her blessed. Her husband is respected when he travels around the world to share messages of God's healing and hope. Our sister Ursh of noble character is clothed with dignity though she played a convincing thug in heavenly voices. Despite pain and hardship, she has the most infectious laugh. Sunday school retreats and parties are always livelier when Ursh is present. She delights in pranks and surprises, especially if she is trying to outwit Stanley. Her lamp never goes out. She is radiant with inner beauty a woman who faithfully follows Jesus is to be praised. Your sisters, the praying companions. We, as a Sunday school class, are so grateful to have had the privilege of being your friends, Ursh. We promise to continue being your praying companions as you travel to California. We hope you find healing and happiness there. We love you, Ursh. A companion blessing. Goodbye, dear Ursh. You loved us well and made us laugh, taught us that tears can heal, and modeled courage well when all else failed. 
The words we shared held in your heart, a true and loyal friend. A sister too, you made us family all, new angels well. But now, we pray you west as we stay east, us here, you there, God everywhere, and angels whispering by, within, between, around us all. Stanley, it has been such a blessing to us since Pastor Tina suggested that we consider joining a small group together with you. Since then, as brothers in the church, we have shared joys and concerns, given and received counsel, provided prayer support, faced issues of health, ethics, work, and personal relationships, life transitions, deaths of family members, and more. We have appreciated your thoughtful insights and openness in our sharing together. We appreciate your faith and its expression in commitment to the worldwide church and the relationships developed in your travels on behalf of Mennonite Mission Network. We appreciate your deep love for and commitment to your family. We appreciate your expressions of care for us and our families. We pray for safety as you and Ursula travel, an awareness of God's continued guidance in your new work and renewed strength and health for both of you in the days ahead. We release you to the care of a new community of faith and friendships, knowing that we continue to support you even from a distance. Hi, this is uh, Stanley. And Ursula. And we'd like to begin first by offering our sincere thanks to Waterford Mennonite Church for having been our spiritual home for the past 27 years, ever since we first arrived in Goshen on the 9th of July, 1993. We're grateful for all of the friendships, the encouragement and support that we have received across these 27 years. And we're thankful for the many prayers that have been offered on our behalf, as well as the opportunities for ministry and to connect with many of you. We lament that during this time of the COVID crisis, we're not able to say our goodbyes in person, um, to see your smiles and to have hugs and uh, handshakes. Um, but we are grateful that through this venue, we are able to say our goodbyes to you. And we're thankful for this moment of blessing we're grateful for all of the goodwill and uh, best wishes we've received as we make this return journey to California. We invite your prayers for us as we travel overland during this next week, that God will bring us uh, safely to our new home in California. And again, we offer you our sincere thanks for all that uh, Waterford has been for us these 27 years. Thank you and be blessed. We hope you come out to California sometime and we hope that we can meet again. If we don't meet uh, on the earth, uh, we'll be sure to meet you in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. Stanley and Ursula, we send you to Southern California with our love and our prayers. We also want to send you with this peace stamp. You will see on the bottom that it's stamped with Waterford Mennonite Church and it's stamped with Goshen, Indiana. When you light this peace lamp, may you be reminded that the light of Christ is in each of you. And as you light this lamp, may you be reminded of your faith community in Goshen that carries you in our hearts and our thoughts and our prayers. This morning, I'd like to end our time of blessing by sharing you a blessing by Jan Richardson. 
Ursula and Stanley. In the leaving and in the letting go, let there be this to hold on to at the last, the enduring of love, the persisting of hope, the remembering of joy, the offering of gratitude, the receiving of grace, and the blessing of peace. May God bless you and keep you. May the very face of God shine on you and be gracious to you. May God's presence embrace you and give you peace. We send you with our love. May it be so. Amen. Well, my friends, it has been good to gather again today, friends near and far, as we worship God and as we bless the Greens as they move on to this next chapter of their life. So I give you these words as a benediction. May you receive them in the spirit with which they are given. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us always. Amen. Go in peace. Uh -huh.